In his home country of Argentina, he's known simply as Dios, God. With a ball at his feet, a genius. But a genius is often flawed, and no one more so than Diego Armando Maradona. There will never be another Maradona. He defines a nation. Yet divides opinion. Technically, the most complete player in the history of the game. Genius or rebel? Magician or maverick? Maradona was the king of Naples. He arrived and they won the championship. Maradona's career has scaled the heights and plumbed the depths in equal measure. He saw clearly that he went up and he used his hand and he punched it in. Ever controversial, but his ability with the football was beyond all doubt. It was hard to sleep when you knew you were facing Maradona. He was fantastic. His ability, his technique, his agility, his speed and his left foot. My mum says I was the best. The tango, the pride of Argentina. Passionate, graceful, stylish. The tango has much in common with Diego Maradona. And his countrymen agree, Maradona was and is more than just a footballer. Maradona is, first and foremost for Argentina, a god, a legendary figure, and enjoys the same standing as Gardel, Evita and Che Guevara. Maradona is Argentina. He's synonymous with the country. Whether you like it or not, he represents many things and he generates enormous controversy in the country. There's a love-hate relationship with him, but at the same time, there's a massive attraction towards all he does and what he says. A living legend, one of Argentina's most important artists, a man who brought joy to the rest of the country like few others have. Like with all famous people, very famous people, there are those who love him and those who don't. He's all the best that could happen to us, and the worst as well. We blame him, or hold him responsible, for all our ills. And he's the one who redeems us over anything else, and makes us feel immortal. I don't know if I'm a symbol. I tried to take my country as far as I could. But it's difficult, because people think that I can achieve things now that I used to achieve as a player. A hero in his homeland, famous throughout the rest of the world. From abject poverty to superstardom, it's been quite a journey. Diego Maradona hails from the Argentinian capital of Buenos Aires. He was born on the outskirts of the city in 1960, in the suburb of Lanús. But it was the shanty town of Fiorito which he first called home. Life was very hard. We always reached the end of the month with nothing left over. There were eight of us, so that's eight mouths to feed. And the only one who was working was my father. My sisters were studying, and my dad didn't want them to work. So he was the only one working, and he had to provide for us. So it was very tough. For the people of Fiorito, survival remains a constant struggle. But from hardship springs hope. And like his neighbors, Maradona would become a product of his environment. The late Francisco Cornejo was Maradona's first guiding light. Cornejo was coach of Los Cebollitas, a team which formed part of the youth system of one of the nation's top flight teams, Argentinos Juniors. But it was only by chance that the youngsters' talents were discovered. There was a boy called Goyo Carrizo, 
and he told me that there was a friend of his where he lived, in Fija Fiorito, who was even better than him. I asked myself, who's going to play better than him? To be better than him, he had to be outstanding. Francis Conecco said, why doesn't he come along? He replied, he doesn't have money. So Conecco gave him a 10 peso note and said, bring him along with you tomorrow. One afternoon, he appeared with Diego. Diego was tiny. Francis, here's the friend I was telling you about. If I told you to look at the boy, he was just another boy. I can honestly tell you that he impressed me a great deal during the training session. In the first session, I did pretty well, scored a couple of goals and enjoyed myself. This lad was different. He'd be dribbling and suddenly play an unbelievable pass to someone who was unmarked. He was creative, he had so much skill. He had the traits of a boy who was much older. The first day, there were three of us watching, the second, ten, the third, twenty, and all to watch this boy and how he played. There were many retired people who went to watch, and I always remember a man, an Italian, who called him over after going out there for about the tenth time and said, young man, because you've given me so much pleasure, I want to give you all that I have, which is this bicycle. Take it, I'm giving it to you. Maradona quickly established himself as a star performer for Los Cebollitas. Success soon followed. I passed the trial, made the team, and I went on to join the youth system. When I turned 13, I became a regular in the youth team of Argentinos Juniors, and we won our division by a big points margin. But we had a great side. Under the watchful eye of Cornejo, Los Cebollitas embarked on an astonishing unbeaten run, 136 games. On the pitch, Maradona dominated. Off the pitch, however, it was a different story. I remember Diego was almost like a son to me when he was small. Off the pitch, when he was with me, he was a humble little boy, laid back. But when he was on the pitch, he became a different person. You saw what he did and were taken aback, how he enjoyed it. Sometimes he'd lose a game and he'd cry. Tears, though, were short-lived. Maradona was simply too good to be held back. And in 1976, he became the youngest ever debutant in the Argentine top flight. He was 15 years old. That's where my dream started, about playing for the big teams. Buying a house for my mum, buying cars, being able to play for Boca, playing for the national team. The dream began that my friends and I fantasised about back then, but we thought it was impossible to make that dream a reality. So the moment I made my debut for the first team, I saw all of those things become a little bit closer, a bit more real. And if any doubt still lingered, four goals against Boca Juniors proved his star quality. At that time, the Argentinian league was dominated by the capital's bigger clubs, Boca, River Plate and San Lorenzo. During this period, Maradona failed to win any honours with Argentinos, yet was undoubtedly the outstanding talent in a modest team. So much so, he finished as the league's top scorer in five separate seasons. There was no one else to score them. The problem was that nobody could score, so I had to get the goals or we wouldn't get any. But it was a great experience at Argentinos Juniors, because Francisco Cornejo was a guy who passed great knowledge on to us. The legacy he left as a footballer and as a person is huge. He knew how to lead us and Argentinos Juniors had a fantastic youth system out of which came great players and not just me. In 1981, his destination was Boca Juniors, Argentina's most popular and successful club. The transfer fee was 500,000 US dollars, a then record between Argentinian clubs. 
For us, it was very sad that he went to Boca, a team that we just don't like at all. Diego was suited to another team, with a different style of play to Boca's. Boca was a team of grit. But here, against whoever we played, people used to say that they couldn't believe such a youngster was playing in the first division. And Diego finished top scorer. Today, Maradona would cost no less than 200 or 300 million euros for sure. But the country didn't speak about anything else. The country went mad. Maradona was a superstar and was signing for the country's most popular club. And he was in good company alongside more experienced campaigners such as Hugo Gatti, Osco Ruggeri and Miguel Angel Brindisi. Maradona blossomed at the Bombonera. And he fulfilled a boyhood dream by joining Boca at the expense of their greatest rivals, River Plate. The whole family supported Boca. It's a passion that you cannot explain. What happened was that River wanted me. And so I invented a story that actually Boca wanted me. River said to my agent that I would earn the same as Passarella and Filiol. So I said that I didn't want to earn as much as them. I just wanted to earn my salary, but I just didn't want to go to River. So I made up that story about Boca. But they didn't have a peso and really couldn't buy anybody. So we agreed a very strange contract with Boca, where they said that they would pay for my apartment. It was ridiculous, really. But I told my agent that I wanted to join Boca, and everything was completed very quickly. Maradona's performances came from the heart. He'd arrived at his spiritual home. Boca mean everything to me. I have two daughters, and one is a bigger fanatic than the other. But when Dalma goes to see them play, she ends up eating her fingers, not just her fingernails. She goes to the games and always says, thanks, Dad, for making me a Boca fan. That's something you just can't buy. Maradona proved inspirational, scoring 17 goals in 1981. He and his beloved Boca were champions. I had an injury, but I still played, and we won the championship in 1981 with Boca. That was absolutely fantastic, because we attracted full houses in whichever stadium that we played. Despite his ability, he still had his critics. Some observers believe Maradona was still far from the finished article. With Boca, he didn't always reach the heights in every game that he showed afterwards, when he was without doubt the best player in every game that I saw him in. At Boca, he had some great performances, some outstanding games, and in others, he was less prominent and went missing on occasions too. Diego was very important in that title success for Boca, and underline the fact that he was a huge star at the time. But his greatest period for me was after 1981. That period would be in another country on another continent. The big European clubs were clamoring for his signature. And after just one year with Boca Juniors, Maradona joined Spanish giants Barcelona in 1982 for a then world record fee of 2.5 million US dollars. This despite a nationwide effort to keep him in the country. Before the arrival of democracy in Argentina in 1983, the country was run by a dictatorship. In all the stadia, the fans would chant a song which had been invented. Maradona is not for sale. Maradona is not going anywhere. Maradona is Argentinian and part of our national heritage. Organizations began to appear, linked to brand names. We started to collect funds so as to attempt to block his transfer and prevent his move abroad. Well, all this didn't work, of course, and he was finally sold to Barcelona. The country was in a bad way. We wouldn't even get paid, and so the club couldn't afford to keep me. So Barcelona came along with the money, and they got me. I never even played in the Copa Libertadores, even when I'd won the domestic title with Boca. I never even played one Libertadores match after winning the league with Boca. It's incredible. At the 1982 World Cup, Maradona was now 21, and Minotti considered him to be mature enough to handle the pressure. As holders, Argentina opened the tournament against Belgium at Maradona's new home, Barcelona's Camp Nou. But national pride remained his sole focus. 
I always put playing for my country before anything else. For me, the Argentina shirt was the priority. And it's not just a priority when you turn professional. That's how I've always thought, ever since I was a small boy. The Belgian game plan was to man-mark Maradona, who as a result failed to influence the game as he would have liked. The Belgians went on to record a surprise 1-0 win. Argentina would have to regroup. Diego was perhaps already the best player in the world in 82 because of the magic he produced on the pitch. But we weren't a team. We were 11 individuals doing our own thing. We never gelled though. We had good players, but we were never a great side. Argentina won their next two games to qualify for the second round group stage. Those wins included two goals for Maradona in a 4-1 defeat of Hungary. They were special to him, being his first in the final stages of a World Cup. So wear the Argentina shirt is the maximum any footballer can aspire to. A player can celebrate a goal wearing the Napoli shirt, for example, but to do the same thing wearing the national team shirt is another feeling altogether. In their opening Group C match, they faced Italy. The Azzurri had scraped through to this stage on goal difference after drawing their three group games. The Italian defender Claudio Gentile was assigned to man Mark Maradona. The Italian game plan was simple. Stop Maradona, stop Argentina. The aim of Gentile was to stop him playing, and it worked quite well, because Maradona didn't have a great game. In order to stop Maradona, you had to use your hands, your feet, you had to kick him. Otherwise there was no way of stopping him. I think he would be even greater if he played football today because no one could foul him as much as they did in 82. Gentile marked him fairly heavily, but it would have been the same if I'd been marking Maradona. The only way you could stop Maradona was like that. Italy played us first in a dirty game, a game that changed the history of football a little, because the skillful players began to be offered protection due to the treatment handed out by the Italians to Maradona, especially Gentile. FIFA changed the rules and began to protect those flair players. That was the intention, to mark Maradona in any way possible. It's not like it was prepared, but we had to anticipate him, get there before him, foul him. All types of things, like making him nervous, not letting him play, not letting him get the ball. You had to think about all those things before the game. Above all, you had to stop him from turning. Because if you let him turn, a player like Maradona cannot have the same effect if he's not able to face goal. And so Gentile did superbly by marking him in that way, sticking tightly to him. Despite receiving a yellow card in the opening minute, Gentile neutralised Maradona. It was treatment he would become accustomed to. And with their star player nullified, Argentina lost 2-1. Italy beat us and we went into the next game against Brazil, knowing that if we were to have a chance of going through, we had to win 3-0. And if you go into a game knowing you have to win 3-0, it's very tough. And when your opponents are Brazil, it's virtually impossible. Without doubt, Brazil had a great, great team. In my opinion, it was the best Brazilian team that didn't win the World Cup. They had some exceptional players. But we also had some great players. We had the bulk of the team from 78 that had won the World Cup. And what's more, there was Diego Maradona, who in those four years had become the greatest player in the world. But the Brazilian class of 82 was a team full of talent. And they took the lead when Adair's free kick led to a tap-in for their own number 10 and talisman, Zico. It was a game where some of the biggest names in world football were on the pitch. We were more of a team, whereas they were more about individuals playing together. 
Brazil went on to win 3-1. The defeat eliminated Argentina from the tournament and they relinquished their crown as World Cup holders. To make matters worse, Maradona's first World Cup ended with a red card. He was sent off for a challenge on Brazilian midfielder Batista. His frustration, all too evident. Diego didn't have a good World Cup in 82. He had great games like against Hungary and also poor games by his standards, especially the last two against Italy and Brazil. Of course, he also got sent off in the match against Brazil. So all in all, it was a sad World Cup for Diego. Next time on Dios, the controversy continues. It reached the point where I didn't want to train with Barcelona anymore. I was at home, waiting to see if anyone wanted to sign me. And in an unfashionable city, he becomes an instant hero. Words can't explain the enthusiasm that it created in the city. People were dreaming about seeing Diego.